Join the Body and Ball Out podcast today. Tune in and check in and listen today. It's the Body and Ball Out podcast today. Chill out and check out what they have to say. Body and Ball Out, the two are lifelong friends. Started a podcast where the fun never ends. The B&B boys sell garbage cans to pay the bills. But check out their podcast, it really kills. Their personalities shine, their stories come alive. Just give them a listen and see why they thrive. Join the Body and Ball Out podcast today. Tune in and check in and listen today. It's the Body and Ball Out podcast today. Chill out and check out what Welcome they have to say. Welcome to the Body say. Podcast. Today, we have a little bit of a change up. Bobby had an emergency with his kids, so our producer, Danny Duvall, stepping in to be his first co-host show ever. Danny, what's up? Uh, doing good. Been working on uh, a lot of research on Walter, so ready to get this going. Yeah, so today we have a, a very special guest walter trout uh some say he's top five guitarists in the world uh famous all over the world he's about to go on world world tour so we are very happy to have walter trout on the show hi walter hey i'm happy to be here man but you know at this point of life i'm happy to be anywhere you know <laughs> yes i feel you there i feel you there so can you just give us a rundown on kind of how you came up and, you know, from an early age, what got you interested in, in what you're doing now and, and kind of how that took off. You're from New Jersey, right? I am from Jersey. But but do you claim yeah, California? I'm from Jersey, and I don't know. You got a problem with that? Uh, you know, I'm, I'm from Jersey here. Sorry, yeah. From what I've read, you kind of claim California as home, right? Well, I've been here since 1974. Yes. Wow. So this really is my home. I, I lived in Jersey for, um, what's that, 22 years. And I went to school there and that's where I was raised. But I moved out here in 74 to have a musical career, you know, and it has worked out. So how was life growing up in the 60s, right? So you were a teenager in the 60s? I certainly was. How was and that? I got I've to heard see it's a lot, a lot of fun. Of the great people. I saw Jimi <laughs> Hendrix and I saw The Cream and I saw Frank Zappa and I, I saw The Birds and I, you know, I, oh, yeah. um, it was very interesting time, the 60s. Now I'm, uh, I'm lucky to have any brain cells left after growing <laughs> up in the 60s. Um, well, and there's course. a lot of guys, <laughs> a lot of guys I grew up with in the 60s who are, who are not real lucid anymore. Because um, it was different days in the 60s. And being a teenager and playing in uh, rock and roll bands in the 60s was, um, I think it was fun. I can't remember. Oh, yeah. What age did you start playing the guitar? What, when did you start learning? Well, let me go back. I, I was going to be a jazz trumpet player. Mm -hmm. And I started studying the trumpet when I was like five years old. And I, I actually played it all through high school. I was in the marching band and the orchestra, and I was the first chair trumpet player, and I was pretty good at it, you know, but, yeah. um, and I, I was really into Miles Davis, and that's what I wanted to do, and little by little, um, things changed for me, and my, my older brother, who knew that I really loved music, um, kept bringing home records that were very different than jazz records that I was listening to with my, with my dad. Um, like my brother brought home the first Bob Dylan album in 1961 or 62. And I was about 10 and it was very different than Miles Davis or Duke Ellington or any of that, but it, it caught me. And I realized it was basically very simple music with three chords. And if I learned those three chords, I could go to parties and sing folk songs and um, impress everybody. And, and, uh, yeah. And, you know, it, but so I did that for a couple of years. And then um, the big the big earthquake, the big, um, you know, the asteroid hitting the world. And I cannot impress upon you young guys the how Im impactful this was but on february the 9th 1964 the beatles were on ed sullivan right. and everything was different the next day everything was different in our lives the next day 
And um, they had in- come and they had put our rock and roll music right back in front of us, but done it a little differently. And um, at that point, OK, I got to get an electric guitar, you know, and I want to play in a band and I'm, I'm playing Beatles songs and monkey songs and stuff. And um, then a year and a half later, uh, my brother came home again and he said, I know you like to play the guitar. You need to sit down and listen to this guy. And it was the very first album by the Paul Butterfield Blues Band. And it had a guitar player named Michael Bloomfield. Mm -hmm. And he was on another planet at that point in 1965. Nobody on the planet played like that guy. And I heard that and I literally, I had to sit down. My brother said, you better sit down. And I did. And that's when I went to my mother. I was, what was I, 14 or 15. And I said, I know what I'm going to do for the rest of my life. I said, you hear that sound that guy is making with his guitar? That's what I'm going to do for the rest of my life. And I've never looked back. All right. So take us from when you decided that. Okay. So you're a teenager. Did you start making money as a teenager? Music? Oh God, no. <laughs> no. But I, I started playing in bands and, right. you know, playing in bars. And um, my friend Jack Jacket, who I met in the ninth grade, who was the best musician I'd ever met. He could play every instrument. Um, he and I started a band and we had horn line and we were doing Chicago and we were doing blood, sweat and tears. And we were taking Rolling Stone songs and turning them into horn songs. And we were doing, uh, you know, uh, Motown and Stax and Sam and Dave and stuff. And we worked a lot. We were a cover band, but we were really good. And um, so that was really I mean, we were out playing all the time, but it wasn't like we were really able to kind of make a living at it. You know, we were struggling, but we were working. And so what um, did you do on the the side? um, Jeez. Go to go to the Acme at 12 midnight and put a steak down my pants and bring it home and eat it. Um, You know, (laughs) (laughs) I'll be honest, you know. We were, but um, at that time, were you writing your own, your yes, own, lyrics, your own music? You were doing all I your was. own stuff at that As time. Matter of fact, a lot of the songs on my first two records were written at that point. I, when I started making my own records in 1989, I had a whole backlog of songs, you know. But um, it, you know, eventually, um, Jack, um, he got a job as a teacher. And he got married and had a kid and, be, you know, went that route. And I kind of had a band then, just a four-piece band. And um, we, we really had a, had a rough time. And I came to California on a vacation to visit some friends of mine. And I saw that there was a really great club scene in L.A. and Orange County. And um, I went back and told my band, hey, if we move to California, we can work. And they all said, yeah, let's go. And we're going to, you know, one by one, they changed their mind. You know, drummer goes, I don't think I want to go. I go, okay. And then the bass player, I don't think I want to go. And finally I said, look, it's just me. I'm gone. And I packed my VW bug. I had 150 bucks. (laughs) I had a Martin D28, a Gibson 335. A Fender Super Reverb, a mandolin, a trumpet, and all my clothes, and I drove to California. I don't think people realize they, they see fame and fortune. They don't understand the grind to get to that point where you're famous, do and, they? And the risk. Like that's a huge risk, just putting all that stuff in your car and driving across the country in, in hopes to find something. Well, I you know, that was it. It was if you're gonna have a dream and you want to chase it, you got, you got to go for it. And I was young, you know, I was like 22 and it was, I can always go back to New Jersey and me and my buddies can go into the A&P and steal steaks at midnight, but, (laughs) or I can go try to do something else, you know, and I, I got here and I just started going around to 
clubs where there were bands and saying, hi, I play and I sing and can I sit in? And it didn't take me longer than two weeks before I had a gig, a steady gig, you know? Wow. So you, you kind of found success pretty quickly then. I mean, not. Well, it wasn't success, but I was working. Right. You know, I mean, it wasn't success where I'm making records and doing tours and and all yeah. that, but it was working in a club every night, working five nights a week and bringing practicing. home a paycheck, you know. And you're practicing. You're practicing what you want to do. It's not like you're working somewhere else and then still doing this on the side for the love of it. You're actually getting to do what you love and practice towards what your career is going to be. Yeah, exactly. And plus... Um, and this is for all the sort of young, struggling guys out there that want to do this. You may be playing in a little bar and there may be 10 people in the bar sitting at the bar and you think to yourself, oh, boy, this sucks. You got to play like there's 10,000 people because you don't yep. know who those people in the bar are. Right. Yeah. Yeah. And I was Absolutely. playing in a bar. I was playing in a bar with a bunch of um, old blues guys. Um, when I, at a certain point, I was playing in a bar with these old blues guys and there were a few people in the bar listening and, and I could have said, oh, this sucks. And I could have just not played with everything I have. <laughs> Little did I know that a couple of those guys were in canned heat and um, they heard me and said, you want to join canned heat? And that changed my life, you know? You never know when opportunity is going to strike. I'm yeah, just you wondering. Know who's sitting there, man. You know? You know, I'm wondering when we talk blues, we instantly think like Delta, Mississippi, right? Uh, was there a big blues scene going on in California at that time? Why not well, looking south? You, you got you got to think I was from South Jersey, so it was more the Delta of the Delaware River, you know? Um but uh, it, th there actually was a blues scene out here. Yes, there was. Really? You know, so let me there, ask you this. There were a so, lot of clubs and a lot of blues musicians. And um, there was a great scene out here with all sorts of musicians. And actually, the town I live in, Huntington Beach, is packed full of musicians. This is sort right. of a, a blues capital and people don't even know it. I is mean, that still going on today? There's still... Well, you know, I I've risen above sort of the local club scene, yeah, so I don't yeah. I don't know. Yeah. You know, that's something that I haven't since I got into canned heat, and which was at the end of nineteen seventy nine. I I haven't been in the local club scene. I've been more touring. All right, so you you kind of wanted to get into this from for rock, right? I mean, you, you're you're listening to the Beatles, and and you, you were in love with rock and roll first. So how did the transition to blues come along? Well, it was that album I told you about, the Paul Butterfield album. And if you guys haven't heard it, it's the album with a song called Born in Chicago. Mm -hmm. Paul mm -hmm. Butterfield, first album. And now when you put that on and listen to the guitar player, you have to understand this was 1965. And the guitar solos we were hearing were George Harrison and Keith Richards. And I love those guys. Yeah, But they play very elemental solos, and here comes Michael Bloomfield, and he's playing at the speed of light, and he's bending strings, and the guitar is screaming, and it was like, my God, who is this guy? And he took it to a whole other place. He took blues playing by people like B.B. King or Buddy Guy. He took that, and he added rock and roll aggression and fire. So that was really what appealed to me, because I will tell you, um, my my parents were music aficionados. My dad had records by B.B. King and John Lee Hooker and T-Bone Walker. I grew up hearing the blues along with the jazz, but it did, hadn't really it hadn't really affected me. When I heard Bloomfield playing it with rock and roll aggression and rock and roll attitude and rock and roll fire, but playing blues, it was a whole other thing. I was like, my God, listen to that, you know? And there's almost like subgenres of blues, aren't there? There's different styles all over the country, like a St. Louis styles blues, there's the Delta Mississippi, and then is there a rock and roll blues? Well, there, there's a lot of um, 
yeah, you could call it subgenres. The blues is a large, it encompasses a lot. And um, I'm one who I'm sort of been vilified a lot by sort of the blues purists because I'm not trying to sound like I'm from Clarksdale, Mississippi, and it's 1950. But if I want to be honest and I want to be real, I am a white kid from New Jersey, a middle class white kid <laughs> from New Jersey. My mother was the teacher in the high school I went to. You know, my dad was a carpenter. I can't if I come out and start trying to play like those old guys from Mississippi, that's not me. In that point, I'm more of an impersonator. I'm an impressionist instead of being an artist. Do you know what I mean? Yeah. Absolutely. Yeah, definitely. All right. So 1979 hits. You join this band. You're now fully invested in blues with your own sort of twist to it. Right. So now what happens? Well, I'm playing with Canned Heat. And, you know, if you know who they are, they're, yeah. you know, one of the biggest blues rock bands in the history of the world. And um, I had actually 10 years earlier, I had gone to Woodstock from New Jersey. I went there with my <laughs> friends and I sat in the mud and watched Canned Heat and they blew my mind. And um, of course I was hallucinating, but they sounded great. And um, then I was 10 years later, I'm, I'm in their band, you know, and I, I toured the world with them for four and a half years. But the, uh, another break came to me when with that band, we opened up for John Mayall, if you know who John Mayall is. And um, he had Mick Taylor from the Rolling Stones. He had John McVie from hey, Eric Clapton Mac played with, with him, him, right? Huh? Eric Clapton played with them, right? Eric Clapton did, yeah. yeah. Wow. And But at this point, he had Mick Taylor and he had John McVie. And Canned Heat opened up. We did three shows. John Mayall and I became friends and um, I ended up basically it's kind of a long story but I ended up in his band standing in the place of Eric Clapton you know and I uh, that's I don't know if you can see this oh wow you can't really yeah, yeah. that's me and Mick Taylor and John McVie in 1981 but um and as a matter of fact, this is, you can't see it, but Mick Taylor is holding a bottle of rubbing alcohol, okay? <laughs> and I did the first gig. I walked up to the hotel. There's Mick Taylor and McVie, two legends. It's one of the Rolling Stones, and they have a bottle. I'm not making this up now. They have a bottle of rubbing alcohol and orange juice and they're mixing drinks. And I said, why are you? Hi, I'm Walter. I play in Canned Heat. I opened up for you last night. Great to meet you guys. <laughs> why are you drinking rubbing alcohol? And John McVie, who was a multimillionaire, said 89 cents a bottle. And uh, I said, <laughs> I have a fifth turn off up in my room. You guys want to drink some real, some good booze? Yeah. So we went up to my room. Some other guys came over. We're having a party. We're drinking the booze and we're all getting drunk. And McVie passed out on the floor, unconscious. And we're playing blues tapes. And I walked over and I said, what does anybody want to hear? And suddenly McVie from Fleetwood Mac, his eyes open and his head popped off the carpet. And he said, please, no Stevie Nicks. And his head went <laughs> back down on the carpet. But um, so I ended up in the band, you know, and, and I did that for five years. And um, that was his. In the world of being a blues guitar playing sideman, that's as high as you can go. And what drives when you to want to John Mayall, you can't get any higher in that genre. Yeah. Why are you looking to go do your own work then if you're at the pinnacle of a blues guitar player? Is it artistic well, here, reasons, money reasons? He's paying me a lot of money. 
I'm traveling first class. I'm staying in great hotels. I'm in this exalted position of guitar player. And I'm coming out every night and I'm playing four or five guitar solos. <clears throat> then when I'm home and I'm not on tour, I go down to this bar at the beach where I have the house band, little bar called Perks in Huntington Beach, right across the street from the pier. And I have my own band and I play five hours a night and I play more guitar than I know what to do. And I realize that the fun, really the fun I'm having playing, playing my guitar I'm having it in a little bar because it's my own band. Right. I'm not backing somebody else up. So you're calling the um, shots on my 38th birthday. I'm playing with John Mayall in a symphony orchestra hall in Sweden. And I'm on stage playing and I'm thinking I'm 38. And I want to, I want to present my music to the world. I want to keep writing songs. I want to sing. I want to have my own band. I, I want to provide the musical direction. And if I'm ever going to do that, I better do it quick because I'm, I'm pushing 40 years old here. At, at that point, had the world heard your music? Was, was the band playing anything of yours or just? No, no, no. I was in John's So Nobody band. knew Walter Trout's music. No. And I even had some journalists sometimes come up to me after gigs and say, when are you going to go solo? You need to go solo, you know? So I had to make the decision on stage on my birthday, I'm going to have to quit and I'm going to have to start my own band. And uh, I went to his room after I said, John, I'm sorry, I'm going to have to leave the band. And He's like a father to me. And he and I wept and we embraced and, and um, we're still very, very close. As a matter of fact, um, in December, I did nine shows double build with him, you know. Yeah, you had that connection forever. So you'll yeah. continue probably to do projects here and there, right? I mean, is that something? Well, that he's 88. And on the 26th of March, he's playing his final show, and then he's he's done. Where's he's that show at? Eight. Where are his you guys doing the final show? in California here. Are you going to be there with him on that? No, I'll be on tour. I'm leaving on tour tomorrow. Awesome, by the way. Will you give us a little rundown of uh, where the tour is going to be real quick, just to kind of interject? I'm, I'm not even sure. I know we start in Atlanta. <laughs> I think Monday night we start in Atlanta. Um, honest to God, I don't know where I'm going. All right. It's on so my let me ask website. This. If you go on my website and click on tour dates, it's Got all you. there. Check that out. So let me ask you this. So what's it like to be on tour? I mean, we've never been on tours. You know, most of the people watching have never been on tour. So you don't even care where you're going. You just get on the bus or plane or whatever. Do you, I mean, what, what's it like? Just take us through that. Well, I'll, I'll give you a perfect story. You know, Jackson Brown, he was on David Letterman some years ago, and you can find this clip. And David Letterman said, so, Jackson, you're out on tour. Jackson goes, yeah. And he <laughs> says, David says to the audience, now, people, you're going to learn something right now. And he <laughs> says, Jackson, where'd you play last night? Jackson goes, I don't know. And he goes, where are you going tomorrow? And he goes, I don't know. They drive you around. You go into a hotel. Um, they drive you to the gig. My tour manager says it's time to play. I go up and I play until he says, now it's time to stop. I stop. <laughs> um, you go to the hotel. You try to get some sleep. You need to do the same thing the next day. And honest to God, my old bass player, he used to call it, he used to call it the LSD effect. And what that means is you don't know what town you're in. You don't know what day <laughs> of the week it is. And you actually don't care. Yeah. It's just. It's, Does it get it's, repetitive? It's, Do you get tired of doing that every day? I'm never tired of doing that, but it is repetitive. Do you change but this is the, this ever? is the exciting thing about it. Every night has the potential 
of being the greatest gig you've ever done or the worst gig you've ever done. Yeah. You never know what's going to happen. There's all these variables. The biggest variable is the enthusiasm and the energy of the crowd because you right. play off that. You feel their energy. If they give you a lot of energy, you're probably going to have a good gig. Um, if they, um, to use a Jersey phrase, if they're sitting on their thumbs, sometimes it's hard to, to gather the inspiration. Now, I've seen um, Bob Dylan in concert, and it's funny you said that because I don't know if it was his worst show ever, but he, I don't know what was going on, but he was not very good that night. <laughs> and they say some people perform off of emotions more than anything. Is that, is that well, true? Well, I do. I don't yeah. know about him, but I do. Also, to me, it's important to um, engage with the audience, to talk to yeah. them. Every song I play of mine has a story behind it. And before I play that song, I tell them the story behind it, you know? And Which actually um, want... pro probably loosened you up, right? I mean, it makes it more fun for you because you're telling a new story, well, your story, to a grand, like a, a new group of people every time. Yeah. So sure. the reactions are different every time you tell it. Exactly. And, Have you and developed... I've certain ways to tell stories like do you know which way like have you developed different maybe strategies to tell the story for maybe different areas well, of people it, or like different cities? See, this is the thing this is the variable of it depends on the crowd and right. every crowd is different and every crowd has a certain kind of energy and every venue is different At every stage you're up there playing and it sounds different to you every night Sometimes you're playing and you close your eyes, it sounds like a record. You're like, man, this is perfect. It sounds like I'm, in, you know, and other nights you're on stage and what you're hearing up there sounds like shit, but <laughs> what's going out in the front maybe is different, right? Because it's going through a PA system. Right. So, so I actually never knew that until we started doing this show. And sometimes we go to different studios and stuff. And honestly, if you can hear yourself back uh, half a second later, it, I can't even like create thoughts in my head. Like it's, 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 it's very distracting and you're performing music. So how, how different is that? Well, that, that's the thing is that, as I say, it's every night it's different. And that's what, one of the things that keeps it interesting. You, you are living this routine where you're in the van you, you hit an IHOP, you have some pancakes, and then you drive for five hours and you check into a hotel. Maybe you get an hour nap. Then you SS and S, which is, which is band lingo for shit, shower, and shave. <laughs> and then you go to the gig. Um, you get to the gig about an hour before you play. They have some food in the dressing room. You maybe have a sandwich. You go on and play for two hours. You go back. The, the routine, a lot of it is the same, but it's that two hours on the stage yeah. that you never really know what's going to happen. And it can be your best or your worst. So it keeps it exciting to me, even after 50, 53 years of this. Right. That's what makes it fun. Do you have any nightmare stories for us? Like worst case, like, I don't know, you walked out and like the sound was all messed up or, I mean, is there a nightmare story that you have that? Oh, uh, there's a few. Yeah. Uh, there's a, what, let me see what's for general. <laughs> Listen, you can say whatever well, you want, honestly. Yeah, well, you I can, mean, um, you know, the real you. There, we have no there are nights show. that, there are nights that you go out and um, like all of a sudden your amp stops working and the PA goes off or you go up to the microphone and you get, you know, you get all these vaults going through your head and um, or there's some drunk. I, I can tell you back when I first went solo, for instance, I was playing in Holland, which is where I do the best in Holland. That's the country I, I still do the best. And I was. I like to get right down in their face. I get right to the edge of the stage. I bend over and I'm playing and somebody's face is this far from me and I'm playing right at them, you know, and um, 
this guy, I guess, figured I was, he thought I was looking at his girlfriend and he had an entire pitcher of beer and he flung it at me and it oh. soaked my head and it soaked my guitar. And um, I left the stage and I said, I'm not coming back. I was drenched with beer, you know. And then um, when they announced that I was not coming back, the uh, people in the audience beat the shit out of the guy. I felt <laughs> bad for him at that point, you know. And uh, but you know, you just never know, you know. You never know what's going to happen, and it really keeps it interesting, you know. Yeah. Are your stage sets the same length? Let's say you go out with with no energy, the crowd's not really into it. You're not feeling it. Are you trying to get through that set as quick? And vice versa, if it's a great night, are you going to extend it a little bit, play a little longer? Yeah, I can, I can tell you that um, I play off inspiration. And when I get that inspiration from the crowd and you can tell them into it and you can tell you play a certain lick and you see them go like this and then you <laughs> sit in the line and they smile and um, you play off that, you can play for a long time. Yeah. You know, do they if, tell you like you got to get off the stage? I'm sorry. Are they telling you you got to get off the stage? You're yeah. going too long. Do you have time limits? Well, it, well, it it depends on the gig. If you're playing a festival and they want you to play an hour and somebody else is coming on, right? You, you play exactly understand. one hour and you leave. And I have so do that you, down to a science. So you have you like know? a you you want you know story song story song. You kind of have that laid out. You know you're not going to like change in the middle based off what you're feeling well i am you do, um, you do. wow as a matter of fact it's only in the last couple of years that i've even made a set list before i go on and that, that's because now i have a couple of guys in my band who who were slash's old band you know slash from wow. guns and roses oh, yes. yeah. i have his bass player and his keyboard player and they want a set list but up until they got in the band, I would just go out and start playing. Um, I And I'd be thinking in my head, okay, what song do <laughs> I play next? You know, but. Um, Have you played in every state in America? Yeah. Oh, yeah. You've played every times. state. That's cool. And, I, and this is a funny one. I, I, when my boys, I have three sons, when they were little, they used to spend the summers on tour with the band and my wife and I, we had a Suburban and we packed the kids in and we'd follow the band around. And every once in a while, maybe my wife would take the boys off somewhere for a couple of days. Like if we're on the East coast, she might say, Hey, I'm going to take the kids to New York city for three days and we're going <laughs> to see the sights, that kind of stuff. And yeah. when one of my sons was in the fourth grade, they gave him a map of America and they said, color in all the states you've been to. And he colored in the entire continental United States and Hawaii. The only one he didn't color in was Alaska. And the teacher said, no, I, I want the ones you've been to. And he said, well, I've been to all of them, you know. <laughs> so, yeah, yeah. All right, so I have a question, and this is just more like me. Just like I want to know the lifestyle that you live. So I don't know. Did you get to see the the Motley Crue story? Like it's, I think it's called The Dirt on Netflix. Yeah, I see it. Okay, so how tr how true is that for most rock stars? And then how true was it for you? Like, did you like live that hardcore party lifestyle like that? Um. And it's night, and it wasn't even that. It was like night after night, the whole tour. They just literally I haven't seen it. drank and did whatever, and then performed, yeah. and then were half drunk, and then just did it again. And well, just all kept I'll tell you is this: is on July the 9th, nineteen eighty-seven, I had my last drink. I had my last reefer. Congratulations! I've been, I've been teetotal. Uh, you know, when I want to drink, I have a glass of water, and if I want to <laughs> really party, I put some yeah. ice in it. <laughs> and, um, you know, I don't even drink fucking soda or I, I drink water. I don't it's take drugs. I don't even like taking aspirin. But in my early years, right, um, 
when I was in Canned Heat and John Mayall's band, the Motley crew were pretty lightweight compared to what we were doing. Are you serious? As you might know, I've had a liver transplant. Yeah, we have that. We have that written down. We want to talk about that. So until Motley crew gets to the point where they need to get a new liver, they should just shut up because we got to (laughs) beat. You know, that's classic. All right, so let's go into that since you brought it up. So you have had a liver failure, and it, from what we researched, you lost the ability to walk, talk, sing, play the guitar, basically all functions, right? Yeah. How did you relearn and, you know, come back to music? And did your style change after that? Because you've relearned it everything. It did change. Yeah. Um, oh, boy. You know, um, you know, I don't want to get real graphic here, but in my younger years, um, you know, I, I spent two years as a heroin addict. I mean, I, I did it all, man. And um, uh, I'm going to lose it here thinking about it. Hold on. We apologize. Anyway, We're not I, had, to I had a disease called hepatitis C, which caused cirrhosis of the liver. And I had symptoms for a long time, which I didn't know what it was. I had chronic fatigue. I had equilibrium problems where I couldn't maintain my balance. My hands would cramp up and I couldn't play the guitar at all. And we found out I had this liver disease and I ended up having to be hospitalized. I ended up in the hospital for eight months. Um, I lost, I lost 120 pounds, which is more than half my body weight. I, I lost the ability to speak. I did not recognize my wife or my kids um finally at the last moment they they gave me a liver transplant and that was may the 26th of 2014 but i was not able to come home until september because it took me so i had to go into so much therapy speech therapy i had to go into a clinic and relearn how to walk and stand up i had to relearn how to talk um, I had not had a bite of solid food for six months. I had a hose in my nose and they were giving me liquid. And um, anyway, um, they sent me home finally in September. What's that? May, June, July, August. That was four months I was in rehab at the hospital. They sent me home and I couldn't play the guitar. I had absolutely no idea what to do with it. No idea at all. It had been wiped clean from my memory because I had brain damage. That's why I had to relearn how to talk. And I still get tongue tied. You wouldn't know it now because I'm babbling. But um, anyway, so I didn't know what to do. I was I was like telling my wife, maybe I get a job at Starbucks or something. I'm pretty good with an espresso machine. And she's like, no, you got to start over. So I sat down and I taught myself from scratch the same way I did when I was 10 years old. I started with chords and bar chords and bending and I worked at it and I did it six, seven hours a day for a year. And were you I, listening and to it, yourself? Were you listening, huh? to, you listening to your own music to teach yourself or other artists? Just working on learning how to play. I wasn't really listening. You weren't I even listening on trying to just relearn everything relearn everything and um at that point the music had kind of come back and uh we decided maybe i should because i hadn't been on a stage in two years maybe i should try playing a gig now most guys that go haven't been on a stage you had to relearn how to play most guys would go down to the corner bar doesn't that make sense I'm going down the bar and see what happens. Not me. I went to Royal Albert Hall in London. And that's where I did my return to the stage. And, um, but I found out that I could play and I could do gigs. And at that point, um, my, my wife said to me, you've been through a lot of trauma. You've been through a lot. And I'm glad you're healthy and I'm glad you're back and you can play, but Walter, you are a pain in the ass to be around (laughs) from this trauma. You either need to go talk to a shrink or you need, why don't you try writing a song? 
And she gave me the idea about writing a song. And in two days, I wrote 18 songs. And wow. that became an album called Battle Scars. And that album, I tell the story of my illness and my recovery in music. And um, it ended up winning the, the Blues Music Award for Album of the Year. And one of the songs won Song of the Year that year. But um, so that, that's a long-winded answer to your story that, yeah. I, and that's, then you asked yeah. if my style that's unbelievable. changed. It's incredible. Well, yes, my style did change because... I used to see the neck in my mind's eye in a certain way. And after I had to relearn now in my brain, I see the neck linear. And, uh, and I don't know how to explain that. But yeah. I, when I hear a lick in my head and I want to play it, I can visualize the lick like, like a road map, how to get there. And my visualization of the neck of the guitar is now linear, and it didn't used to be. So, yeah, my style changed. All right. So, actually, our co-host got here. So, we're going to back this computer up because there's we're getting to the really interesting parts here. We got we got a good amount of questions left for you because we want to get into some, some different stuff. But I'm going to bring him in if that's okay. We're going to take like a 10-second break. Yeah, that, man. What are the chairs? Go ahead and grab him. Open that door, too. It's hot as can be in here. It's hot. Grab a chair, pull up. You might as well stay on, Danny. It's going pretty well. <clears throat> Don't be alarmed if the co-host looks exactly like me. Yeah, they're brothers. And they look wow. like a... Two, they're yeah, two I was years gonna say old. Danny's back. What's your name, man? No, I am Danny. This is Danny. This is Bobby coming in. <laughs> I was gonna say, man, that guy looked just like Danny. Well, he will in a minute. Yeah, he, he okay. looked pretty close to each other. <laughs> so again, returning to the show, co-host Bobby Duvall had How a little, doing? little deal with his kids okay, today. You're Bobby. I'm Bobby. Yep. Yeah. Hi, Bobby. How you doing? Good. Good. Listen to you outside the room. Interesting stories. Glad to have you on. Yeah, he missed okay, some good stuff. Right. He's definitely he's definitely finally going to get to rewatch an episode and learn some stuff. So, all right. So this kind of leads us to uh, the next part of the deal. And uh, this is kind of – I think there's a lot of interested people in this. So we kind of wanted to get your take on this. But So you were influenced by Robert Johnson. Were you in, Or were you influenced by him? Because well, I mean, I, yeah. I, I love hearing Robert Johnson, and I love country blues, I think. Yeah. My favorite sort of acoustic country blues guy would be Blind Willie Johnson. He's sort of my favorite one. But, yeah, Robert Johnson, um, uh, Big Bill Brunsey, Blind Willie Johnson, Sunhouse, you know, Johnson. Lightning Hopkins. You know Johnny Johnson? Yes. He's from – piano that's player? Where, yeah, we're recording from his hometown. That's where we're from. What town is that? Fairmont, West Virginia. Oh, well, cool, man. I actually, I will tell you, when I was with John Mayall, I did a gig in New York City with Johnny Johnson. This is probably 1982. And um, he actually had playing with him that night. He had Steve Jordan, who's now the drummer in the Rolling Stones. But Johnny Johnson asked me if I wanted would join his band and play guitar. But I was like, well, John Mayall, um, uh, you know, I got a good gig with John yeah. Mayall. I'm not quitting, you know. Hey, hey Walter. So we're, yeah. we're talking about Johnny, Robert Johnson, Johnny Johnson, obviously the history of the crossroads, the devil being involved with blues. That's right. That's what the conversation I want to have. Cause I've been to the crossroads, the, the one that was made, for the tourist and the actual in, crossroads locations in Mississippi. In Clarksdale. Yeah. yeah. I've been so, there too. Yeah. You've been to you. So you've made the journey to the crossroads. Well, I didn't make a journey. I was on tour and we drove past it. They've sort of made kind of a touristy thing out of it with that big sign, yeah. you know, yeah. but that's cool. I, I'm, I'm yeah. all for whatever they got to do to keep the blues in front of people and to keep it alive. I'm all for it. For sure. As a, as a blues artist, how do you feel? When you hear the stories of somebody, hey, I went to the crossroads and sold my soul to the devil. You know, I've heard many different artists say, like, hey, I made a deal with, with the guy and yeah. different things like that. How, what's your feelings on that? 
Well, I will tell you what B.B. King told me. We talked about that, about this music selling your soul to the devil. And here's what B.B. King said to me, Walter, that's bullshit. And he <laughs> said this, he said, something this beautiful could not come from the devil. This is, yeah. this is, comes from God. Why do you think that people, B. why B. do you think King, artists say that? To me, is the greatest blues man that ever lived. So why do you think artists say that? Do you think it's like, it's a cool thing? Like, I think it, I think it's just some sort of, um, I don't know. It's just that mythology thing of, you know, when, when, when guys started playing the blues back in the early 1900s, um, there were a lot of people who thought th that they were turning away from the church, you know, and, and that Different. the church was the music of God and, and the blues and jazz was the music of the devil and all that. So that's and that's, that's, just, that, that's where, where all of that comes from. But I can think... agree with B.B. King that something that beautiful is not going to come from yeah. the devil. Do you think someone like Robert Johnson, who wrote Hell Hell Hellhound's Coming to Get Me, I'm sure you've heard that. You yeah. know, Hell Hellhound's knocking on my door, Hell Hellhound's falling. Do you think he used that then to sell records? Because people are obviously interested in it and that – you know, they want to hunt it. Do you think they're using that to, to make their well, own? Well, no, I, I think maybe he felt that, you know. I mean, he was not he was not a big star in his day. Right. He was playing at house parties, and he was riding freight trains from town to town, and he was playing on street corners. And, um, you know, the, it, it was very different times, but he was not some sort of big star in his day at all. He became a big star later when those those records really sort of came to be listened to back in the late 50s and early 60s, you know? Have, have you ever played his music? Because they say some of his uh, songs are the hardest in the world to play. I think Eric Clapton said it was it's the hardest well, music Well, if you want to play guitar like Robert Johnson, yeah, that's that's very difficult. But that's an acoustic guitar with one guy i'm i want to play an electric guitar and i want to play in a band yeah. you know it's a whole different animal right yeah well you're considered by different polls as a top five guitarist of all time you're also considered a top blues player of all time do you have like a mount rushmore blues music musician top top four top yeah like a yeah, top four. Like, who would you put on there? Like, who are the guys that you looked up to or, like, the guys that you think are the best? You said B.B. King's your favorite. So B.B. King, Ray Charles. There, There's the top two right there. Um, then, you, of course, you got Hal and Wolf. Um, and probably Muddy Waters. And I think that's your top four right there. Walter, is it hard? Hal and Wolf, still to this day, if you listen to Hal and Wolf, it's like – it's from another planet, man. It's yeah. it's like, how did this guy come up with this stuff? You know? Walter, is it is it hard to be a white artist in a predominantly black uh, culture? Culture, he music. Kinda, he kind of hit on this. He kind of hit on it, yeah. Well, but I mean, I, you know, yeah. of course, there the blues purists want to say that, but. I can tell you, let's let's take that line of reasoning and let's go further with it, okay? Um, you can't play the blues if you're white because you, you're, and you're not from Mississippi and it comes from that culture. And I understand that. But if we're going to take that logic further, do you know who Yo-Yo Ma is? Yep, absolutely. He's the his, greatest, his, he, he's the greatest oh. classical celloist on the face of the earth. His skill is he's, insane. He's Asian. So yep. classical music, the classical music that is played by orchestras was really the music of white Europeans in the 17, 18, and 1900s. So he shouldn't be considered valid, you know, <laughs> because, I mean, and, and Kathleen Battle, who's one of the greatest opera singers in the world, who was a black lady, Opera was invented in Italy and France in the 1700s by white people. So her her vocals shouldn't be considered valid. That is an extension of this whole logic of this, this race thing with art. Oh, yeah. 
And at a certain point, we've got to fucking get past it. That's like somebody saying, you know, do you don't think Johnny Winter can play the blues and he's as white as it gets, you know? Well, so I, I just I I have heard this all my career trying to be in this genre. And um, all you can do is say, well, that if that's how you feel, that's OK. But I'm going to keep doing what I'm doing, you know. Right. But I, it, it is a valid question you asked, because that is a big discussion in this genre for sure. You think you have to prove yourself to show the black culture wrong? They're like, hey, I'm a white guy. And an elderly white guy, but I can still play that. I can still play the guitar well, as good as the anybody. Thing the thing is, the thing is, I played with a lot of black blues artists, and they hired me because they liked the way they play. They never had a problem with me. I'll give you a list. I played with John Lee Hooker, Big Mama Thornton, Percy Mayfield, Lowell Folsom, Eddie Cleanhead Vincent, Bo Diddley, the soul singer Joe Tex. It goes on and on with these guys. When I was in the, those bands, I was the only vanilla fella in the band, and I was in my 20s, but they all hired me, and they told me they loved the way I played. And so that whole thing of, of the, the white guy can't play the blues, that's really the academics and the music critics and the snobs who come up with that. But the, the musicians who are black, that they all they want to know is if you can play, you know. John Lee Hooker's band leader was a man named Deacon Jones, and he was one of the greatest Hammond players on the planet. And there is a documentary out on my life, you can find it. There's a fucking documentary about my life, and in it, Deacon Jones is interviewed, and he says, He says, you can be green and step off a spaceship, but if you can play the blues, you're in the band. That's his quote. Yeah. You know, I'm glad you went into that about, uh, yo. you said his name was Yo-Yo. Is that his name? Yo-Yo Ma. So I talked with, I've been talking with a younger blues artist who said he's he knows you well, and he's from England or, or Europe, and he's playing the blues over there. His name is... Uh, Ainsley Lister, and I he, know Ainsley very well. Yeah, he wanted me to mention that to you today. I played on his very first album, and he's over in Europe playing the blues. And yeah, that's not a that's not a blues, you know. It's not from Europe. It's an American genre. Yeah, yeah. He, he said, "Best of luck on your upcoming tour." By yeah. the way. Oh, well, thanks. Talking. You know, he, even though we're talking in. in I agree with you. You step off a spaceship, you can play, you can play. But you have to admit, there is something special about going to Clarksdale, Clarksville, Mississippi, and being where, where it was all started, in a sense. Oh, and I, I that, know that's great. My wife and I did the whole blues trail a couple it's years awesome, ago. It's awesome. We just did that we last followed year. followed the whole trail. We went to the Dockery Plantation, and and we we did all that. Hello? In 10 minutes. In 10 minutes. Okay. That was my wife there. I got we're almost people. done. We're almost done. So um, I got like, so one, the, one more. Let, me, let me finish this. And it is <laughs> great to go where it was invented and it, it, it came about. And, and, you know, it did come out of the suffering and the oppression that, that, that these people felt in the South. Um, but like I say, I, I'm not a black guy from Mississippi. And if I want to be authentic, the only way I can be authentic is by playing directly from my heart and my soul, who Walter Trout is, the kid from the little town in South Jersey, playing my own, my own feelings and my own, my own joys and my own sadness and my own frustrations and my own visions. And that way I'm authentic. If I can go back to the hotel after the gig and look in the mirror and say, I gave them the best I have tonight, then I can sleep well. And that yes, way I'm authentic. I'm not going to come out and imitate Albert King. And to be honest, when I see young guys who get up and they just come out and play Albert King licks all night, I am fucking bored to tears. <laughs> yeah, I'll go, I'll, I'd rather go listen to Albert King. You know, do something right. your own. Come up with your own voice. Come up with your own, your own. I, I, I'm not feeling you, dude. You're an impersonator. 
you're like when somebody gets up and tries to talk like some politician or something and sound like them, that's what you're doing with music. Come up with your own approach, you know? And um, so that there's a lot of those guys that come out and they try to play like, like Muddy Waters did in 55 and they bore the fuck out of me. And it's because I, I listen to them and I go, you know, I want to hear Muddy Waters. I want to hear where this comes from. I don't want to hear some guy imitating it, you know. But, man, you got me going there, dude. <laughs> <laughs> well, we know you got to go soon. So uh, one last question. So I know that you don't really care about where you're going on tour. Does this tour go to Europe? No, but I go to Europe uh, and um, this tour is basically the East Coast. I know I'm going to be in New York. I know I'm going to be in Connecticut. I know I'm going to be in New Hampshire. Um, I know I'm going to start in Atlanta. I know I'm going to be in Virginia. But um, I come home on the 10th. Let me see. I do more gigs in America in May. In June, I do the entire month of June. I do two weeks in England. Then I go to France, Switzerland, Holland, and Germany. So that's the whole month of June. Well, let me ask you this. So when there's like a conflict or anything going on, you know, around the world, does your, have you ever had anything change? Have they ever canceled a tour or anything like that in your whole career? I canceled a tour because of COVID. I got you. That was it then, huh? And I had to cancel a tour when I got sick with my liver and I had to be put in a hospital, of course, because I'm like dying, Right. But I will tell you, after 9-11, two weeks after 9-11, I was supposed to do a tour of Europe. And every act, every American act canceled their tours. And I said, you know what? I'm going. And if they want to come and shoot me or do whatever, I'm going. But I'm not going to just base my life in fear here. And I'm going to go play. And I got to say... The people in Europe were grateful that I had come over there and we had great shows, you know? Yeah, I commend you for that. Definitely don't live your life in fear, for sure. I mean, yeah, yeah. I mean, there is caution. When when I canceled because of COVID, that, that was one thing. But you got to understand, because I had a liver transplant, they, yes, yeah. I, they have turned off my immune system, right. you know, or I will reject this liver. So I am on immunosuppressants. I take them every day and I'm very, very susceptible to getting a cold or, you know, I, I'm, I, I get infections incredibly easily. So when COVID came around and really kind of blew up, I, but I wasn't the only one, everybody stopped. Right. There were no more gigs. All the venues closed. Yeah, it wasn't really a choice even. It was everybody was shut down. Hey, hey, Walter, I have a question. We do it. With every guest we have on, we do a giveaway for all our fans that watch, fans of yours, fans of ours, everyone that tunes in. Um, and I got to be the guy that tries to bum something off everybody we bring on. So <laughs> any chance we could get a guitar signed by you to give away or tickets to a show or any, anything really that you'd be willing to let us have to do as a uh, giveaway for the show? I will tell you what, um, if somebody wants to look up my schedule, where I'm going to be, in the next couple of weeks, it's on waltertrout.com on tour dates. Yep. If they're in the vicinity and they want to come to the show, I'll put two people on my guest list and they can get in as my guest. Awesome. Thank you, man. I appreciate awesome. it. How's that appreciate sound? It. But you'll That's have to great. keep in touch with me. They'll have to get through to you. Yeah. And yeah. Then yeah. Send me a message and go, hey, these two people want to come to your show in what, New York or something. And, and I will be happy to do that for them. Awesome. That'd be awesome, awesome man. We, we appreciate, appreciate it a lot. Well, Walter, you are an amazing individual. You're super talented. <laughs> I, I love the last hour we got to spend with you. I hope one day we get to meet in person. You know, I, I enjoyed this yeah. thoroughly. You're in West Virginia, right? Yeah. West Virginia. yeah West We're Virginia. close to Pittsburgh. Okay. I don't know if you ever do shows in Pittsburgh. I am doing a show in Pittsburgh. I have to come out. Um, about an it hour might and even half. be on this tour. It's it's Jurgles in Warrendale. Oh, okay. that's, yeah, that's yeah, not yeah. far at all. Now yeah, I'll we, tell you what. If if you guys want to come to that, 
you guys send me a message and I'll put you guys on the guest list. Appreciate okay? yeah, I'll send you a message. Yeah. Appreciate but, that. But definitely let me know in advance so so I have time to get the names to my road manager. Definitely. Yeah, definitely. But like I said, I got Slash's old band. I got Edgar Winter's old drummer. My band's kicking ass, man. I guarantee <laughs> it. I bet it's quite a show. I can't wait to see it. Yeah. Well, Walter, we know you have plans with your wife, so we will let you go, and we really appreciate your time, yeah, man. Thank you for yeah, everything. Thank, thank, you, thank so you so much. I enjoyed this, man. We'll yeah, do it, it was again a good time. Sometime. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. yeah. Next I time got some person. good stories. I guarantee uh, it. About some of those, some of those people I played with, I got some <laughs> very good stories. Um, but I really enjoyed this, and thanks for getting in touch with me. This was fun. Yes. Yeah. No, thank you, thank you, know, sir. Thanks for being on the body. The gig, okay. Yeah. Yeah. Thank you. Take care, man. You might be coming home Then I realized I was dreaming That I just lay there all alone Every day without you You know it feels just like a hundred years 